Before we jump into our teaching, I want to acknowledge Cheryl and Pam Williams. Cheryl and Pam, will you stand in the house, Cheryl and Pam? You can't hide. There you go. There's Pam right there and Cheryl. We can put our hands together for Pam and Cheryl. Their family is in a season of uh, transition. They're going to be making some moves. And I just want to celebrate their family, them along with Darren and Diane Williams. They have a huge history in this church. They spent a lot of resources, building, foundation. There are pillars in the history of this church way back with Harvest Time Assemblies of God, now the Bay Church Brentwood. And humility is understanding that we stand on the shoulders of the people who came before us. And individuals like this who invested year after year after year made it possible what we're doing today. So we honor you. We celebrate you. We pray God's blessing in your new season. And remember, we're online at the Bay Dot Church. So we love you guys. God bless you guys. This is week three in our series, Arguing with Jesus. And I want to start off asking you a question. Anybody in the room ever experience the birth of a child? You witnessed the birth of a child. You saw with your own eyes this miracle. Anybody in the room, you've seen this. I believe it's one of the most beautiful, miraculous things in life. I've had the opportunity to see it four times. My wife giving birth and me just saying, you can do it. You can do it, right? <laughs> and every time I see this, I'm overwhelmed with emotions. It's, it's a miracle. I feel so much joy. I, I, I cry a little bit. It is a beautiful thing. Top, top moments in my life. Top moments. Up there with the Raiders going to the Super Bowl. It's way up <laughs> real high on the bottom. But here's my observation. And let me know if you agree or disagree. It appears as though, it appears as though there is some pain involved in giving life. Would you agree or disagree? I say that because there's a lot of he's and ho's and ooh and clinching of teeth and push and here it comes and ah, right? Here comes the baby. And I want to say all that because life is a fight. We enter life, pain, blood, and tears, and we are going to exit life, pain, blood, and tears. Life is a fight. Think about how Jesus' story started. He was born in a manger. A manger, not Kaiser Permanente <laughs> with a bed, adjacent shower with soft music playing in the background, but a manger probably next to some animals with dirty rags and a cold floor. And we read that Jesus' parents take him to the temple for purification purposes. There's an old man named Simeon in the temple, and he's waiting for Israel's hope, the Messiah, to come one day. He sees Jesus' parents walk into the temple. He takes the child into his arms. What a moment. God in human flesh, salvation in his arms. He looks at Mary, and he makes this statement. He says, the rise and fall of many in Israel is because of this child. And a sword was going to pierce your soul. Translation, Jesus' life is going to be marked with a lot of conflict, a lot of tension, a lot of division. And those that follow Jesus are going to experience suffering as well. In Romans 8, we read that we are heirs with Christ, provided that we suffer with him in order that we may be glorified with him. Jesus taught in this life... You will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. He also told his followers that if you desire to follow after me, you must deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me. Life is a fight. Why am I telling you this, this beautiful Sunday morning? I'm telling you this because for those of you who are not Christ followers, first of all, welcome to the Bay Church. We are glad you are here. We're here to support you on your spiritual journey. But maybe one of the reasons that has prevented you from starting a relationship with Jesus Christ is the problem of pain and suffering. That's the case for one scholar, writer, C.S. Lewis, who growing up, he experienced the death of his mother, then the emotional abandonment of his father. He was ostracized by his colleagues at Oxford. He witnessed painful effects of war. And then when he finally finds love, he experiences the 
loss of his wife. Uh, that, would you agree that would cause me to maybe question, is there a God, and if he is a God, is he good? I say life is a fight for those of you who are Christ followers in the room. Why? Because according to Dr. Tim Keller, never has there been in the history of the world a group of individuals who believe that life should be smooth, easy, and comfortable. Come to Jesus and everything is going to be amazing. Come to Jesus and you will experience Hakuna Matata. <laughs> it means no worries for the rest of your days. Right now, that's not the reality. And sometimes as Christ followers, life hits us and we think, what's wrong? I must have done something wrong. Someone must have screwed up. That's exactly the story of Job in the Old Testament. All hell breaks loose. His friends go to Job and said, you must have done something wrong. But then here comes Jesus, lives a perfect life. He had no sin and had so much difficulty and opposition and then died a violent death. I want you to know today that life is a fight. I want us to answer the questions, week three of arguing with Jesus. Yes, life is a fight. When is the fight? Where is the fight? And what is our hope? When is the fight? Where is the fight? And what is our hope? Our passage today is Jesus arguing with the devil himself, evil personified in the wilderness. This happens in three of the gospel accounts. I want to look at it from Luke's account. He's the only non-Jewish writer. He's writing to Theophilus so that he would know that he knows that he knows there is certain truth in what he is saying. This is chapter 4. We'll read the first two verses and pause. It says this, And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil, and he ate nothing during those days. And when they were ended, he was hungry. I can imagine he was hungry 40 days. I fasted one day this week. And I was complaining, I was miserable. That was just 24 hours, 40 days he was fasting. Now, as we read this, our Old Testament spider senses should be tingling right now. Remember, the Bible is a unified story that leads to Jesus. The author is doing something intentional. He's letting us know that Jesus is the representation for Israel as well as for humanity. What do I mean by that? Well, just as the nation of Israel was led into the desert to be tested after crossing the Red Sea, Jesus is led into the desert to be tested after crossing the Jordan in baptism. Just as Moses fasted 40 days and brought the Ten Commandments, Jesus is fasting 40 days. He's going to bring a new covenant. Just as the nation of Israel bowed before a golden calf, Jesus is going to be tested to bow before the devil and take a shortcut. Why all the correlations? Because the Bible is a unified story that leads to Jesus. And the gospel writers are writing the account of Jesus, mimicking the story of Israel. Jesus did not come to replace Israel. He came to be the hope of Israel, the Messiah of Israel, the representation of Israel. And why did he need to do that? Because the nation of Israel did they fail or did they succeed in the wilderness? Big time fail. We read that God did miraculous signs. He pulled them out of slavery, brought him, brought all of them into the desert. And then we see grumbling, complaining, whining. It's hot. I'm tired. It's better in Egypt. I miss the melons and the cucumbers. I miss the leeks. What are leeks? I miss the onions. I miss the garlic. I'm tired of this manna and quail stuff. And they fail miserably in the garden. And what should have been a short trip to the promised land end up being 40 years of wandering in circles and circles and circles. Friends, if you complain, if you don't follow God's guiding, you will find yourself going circles and circles, wandering with no direction. But what's interesting about that, there are two people that do make it to the promised land. Their name are Joshua and Caleb. An interesting fact, Jesus' name in Hebrew is Yeshua. Yeshua in English is Joshua. Is it a coincidence that Joshua makes it to the promised land where Israel failed? Yeshua will succeed. Let's take it another layer down. 
Jesus is tempted with food. Where else in our Old Testament is someone tempted with food? A shiny red apple in a garden. We have the Garden of Eden all over again. Adam and Eve created in the image of God. These are God's icon. He created his kingdom. He put his image in the garden. And here comes this evil. Here comes something that's in rebellion. Here comes something that hates God and hates his goodness. We don't know much about it yet, but we know this it wants to drag it back to darkness and chaos. And Adam and Eve are deceived and they eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God said, don't eat of this tree because in the day you eat of it, you will surely die. And when they ate of that apple, their eyes were open. They noticed they were naked. And the first time in history, there was guilt and shame and fear and they hid themselves. How many thank God that's not how the story ends? God comes and says, where are you? How many times when we sin against God or against our spouse, sometimes we hide? What have you done? Well, the woman you gave me. How many men blame their wife for all their problems? See, no, don't raise your hand. Don't raise your hand. <laughs> the woman you gave me, I was doing just fine. No, no, no. It is not good for man to be alone. And all the men said, amen. It's not good for man to be alone. Women, Eve, you represent humanity. What happened? The devil deceived me. She was more honest than the men. And then Jesus gives consequences. He tells to the serpent that there's going to be a crushing of the head and a striking of the heel. The crushing of the head is one day someone is going to come and have victory where they defeated, but there will be the striking of the heel. These are not cute coincidences. This is a beautiful, beautiful story that leads to Jesus Christ. You see, he is the truer, better Israel. He is the truer, better humanity. And where they failed, we need someone to come and put all things right. Where is the fight? When is the fight? Where is the fight? What is our hope? Well, let's keep reading. I gave you some interpretation. Can I give you one application thought before we continue? Notice, Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit. I want to ask you a question today. What are you full of? <laughs> not what is your spouse full of, not what is your boss full of, not what is the person sitting next to you full of. What are you full of? If Jesus became flesh, he became human, fully God, fully human, but he lived a life that conquered. He lived a life of victory. He, he lived a life and did things that no one else before him did. What were some of those lifestyles and habits? Well, the author Luke wants us to know just in chapter 4 alone, he was full of the Holy Spirit. He was led by the Spirit. He came back in the power of the Spirit. He quotes Isaiah and says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And then he cast out a demon. That's just in chapter 4 alone. Is it possible that the author wants us to know that there is something important about the Holy Spirit. The problem is we've kind of lost our way when it comes to the Holy Spirit. Maybe church traditions, maybe practices. I want to let you know that the Holy Spirit doesn't make you weird. It doesn't make you bark or quack or fart or roll around on the ground. That is not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has come to empower you to be witnesses to the kingdom. The kingdom of God is here. That is what the Holy Spirit came to do. When you receive the Holy Spirit, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And that is still the purpose of the Holy Spirit here today, to empower you to usher in the kingdom of God. You are a holy temple. You are a royal priest. That's why the Bible says, do not defile your temple with the things of the world because you usher in the kingdom of God. When you walk into a room, the demon's better saying, uh-oh, here comes Pan. Uh-oh, here comes Cindy. Here comes Ron. Here comes Sandy. Here comes Karen. Here comes Ray. Here comes Grandma Beth because you usher in the Holy Spirit, you carry His presence where you go. There were these seven brothers of Sceva trying to cast out demons, and the demon said, I, I know Paul, I know Jesus, who are you? There is power. We need to walk by the Holy Spirit. Don't get lost in bad 
theology. Who is the Holy Spirit? What does Holy Scripture reveal about the Holy Spirit? First of all, no pastor, no person can fully describe the Holy Spirit. There are just some things that are too far beyond us. But this is what the Holy Scripture reveals. It reveals this, that he's a person, that he's God, that he's eternal and holy. He has a mind of his own. He prays for us. He has emotions. He has his own desires and will. He's omnipotent, omnipresent, and omniscient. That just means he is all-powerful. He's everywhere at all times, and he knows everything. Friends, that is comforting. That is comforting today. When is the fight? Where is the fight? And what is our hope? Well, let's keep reading. This is verse 3. It said, The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. Jesus answered him, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. The devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time, and he said to him, To you I will give all this authority and all their glory It has been delivered to me. I give it to whoever I want. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. And Jesus answered him, It is written, quoting Deuteronomy 8, You shall worship the Lord your God, and you shall serve him only. Excuse me, Deuteronomy 8 is when he quotes, Man shall not live by bread alone. But here he's quoting Deuteronomy three times. Notice, it is written, it is written, it is written. Let's see the third tactic of the enemy. He says he took him to Jerusalem. He set him on a pinnacle of the temple. And he said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, He will command His angels concerning you to guard you. And on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, It is said, or it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. Life is a fight. Oh boy, it's a fight. But when is the fight? Where is the fight? What is our hope? Question number one, when is the fight? Answer, always. There always is a fight going on. In Ephesians, we read that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and spiritual forces, and there's dark things going on in the world. And you may think, man, that's weird. How can anyone with above a third grade education believe that there's a devil. I mean, come on, pointed ears, pointed pointed tail and a pitchfork. Well, that's not what we're talking about. Modern secularism thought that there's no devil. There's there's just psychosocial issues. And if you fix this and that, things will get better. Well, then how do you explain the Holocaust? (coughs) Educated, refined, listen to Mozart. There is evil in the world. No one disputes that. But where does this evil come from? And I believe the Bible gives us the answer. We read in Genesis 3 that there is a creature who is in constant state of rebellion against God. He is on a mission to ruin God's world for other creatures. Humans have joined the spiritual rebellion, and it leads to chaos and death. Now this rebellion is interwoven with the spiritual rebellion, and this happens over and over and over again. I'm not sure what your view of the devil is, but... Turn on any music award show and you'll see a blatant satanic ritual performed. It's not even hidden anymore. Turn on the news. You'll see genocide. You'll see war. You'll see mass shootings. There is evil in the world. I'm here to tell you that it's from the Satan. Satan is not his name. It's a title. He is the adversary. He is the prince of lies. The Bible says that he roams around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour We read that the enemy wants to kill, steal, and destroy. I want you to know that there is a fight, and it's always taking place. Notice that Israel was led into the wilderness. Jesus was led into the wilderness. What is the purpose of the leading into the wilderness? First of all, that messes with my theology. Why would the Holy Spirit lead me to be tested? And the answer lies in the definition of what it means to be tested. Some translations say led to be tempted. Some older translation to be tested. The Greek verb is parazzo, and it more accurately means to be tested. Now, what is the purpose of a test? How many people enjoy taking tests in here? Raise your hand. You love taking the time. Uh, Some of you do. I don't care for them very much. But the purpose of a test is to reveal 
Were you studying or were you checking the girl out across the room in the classroom? Were you studying or were you playing Halo all night with your friends? And <laughs> that was me in college. And I, were you <laughs> studying? Were you listening? Or, or, or the test reveals the authenticity of something. And we read in Deuteronomy that the Israelites failed. God took them to the wilderness to see what was in their heart, to humble them, to discipline them, to make them a nation so that it could be a blessing to the entire world, but they failed. And just as the Spirit led Israel into the wilderness, the Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness. For what purpose? To let you know that He is the real deal. When God shouted when Jesus was baptized, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased, please, Jesus is now showing that authenticity and authenticating it right here in the wilderness. He gets attacked with every temptation that everyone before Him got, and it, He defeats it. It is written, it is written, it is written. We got to know the truth from the lie and only testing reveals those things. You want to know if this is 24 karat gold or gold plated? Let's get an iodine test. You want to know if this is a diamond or cubic zirconium? You got to get that diamond tester. You want to know if this is Gucci or Fucci? You look on those glasses, do they say made in Italy or made in China? You're going to know the difference. And here is the spirit bringing Jesus into the wilderness to authenticate he is the son of God. He is who he said he is. He can do what he said he can do. He is going to have victory when Israel failed, when humanity failed. He's going to prove that he is the son of God. That's why he was led to be tested. Why is he tested? Because there's a fight. There's a fight going on. It doesn't mean that there's going to be moments of peace and moments of joy. Life is beautiful. I want you to hear that. Sometimes people say life is a this and you die. Sometimes people say life is terrible. Life is fill in the... No, life is beautiful. God created the world and said it is good. Then he created humanity and said it is very good. Yes, there is sin. Yes, there is brokenness. But Jesus came to make things right. He said, I come to usher in the kingdom of God and one day he's going to come and put everything back just like it was in the garden. When is the fight? The fight is always. Where is the fight? Answer, right down the middle of your heart. Two kingdoms vying for your allegiance. Where is the fight? Right between your heart. And every day you have to make a decision, what kingdom are you going to follow? Are you going to follow the kingdom of God and walk by the Spirit? Or are you going to follow the kingdom of the devil and walk according to the flesh? You get to decide. Jesus said, I put before you life and death, blessing and curses. You get to choose. Choose life. Some people say, oh, how can a loving God send people to hell? Friends, God does not send people to hell. Hell is the reward for a life lived that had wanted nothing to do with Jesus. Where is the battle? Right between your heart. Two kingdoms vying for your allegiance. And I want us to expose the tactics of the devil because he doesn't create, he just manipulates. He doesn't create, he just twists things and fabricates things and lie. And the more we know about our enemy, we know where the front is coming, the more we can be prepared. Let's look at the enemy's tactics. Number one, he says, if you are the son of God, he's tacking Jesus's identity. Boy, I think we have an identity crisis in our culture today. A huge identity crisis. But I want to let you know what the Bible says about you. That you are a child of God, wonderfully and fearfully made. You are not a mistake. You are not an accident. If you have poor self-esteem right now, I want to let you know that Jesus loves you. That he knitted you in your mother's wombs. There is a plan. There is a purpose. And he wants to have a relationship with you. Never doubt that. And that ain't going to work on Jesus because he just heard his father say, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. That, that's not going to work. He tries twice. It doesn't work. So what about this? He says, turn these stones into bread. Dr. Tim Keller gave me this insight and I thought it was amazing. He said, Jesus just finished his fast. 40 days. His fast is done. He can eat. What's the big deal about turning stones into bread? 40 days he fasted. The fast is done. If you want to eat, what's the big deal? And Dr. Tim Keller said this, if Jesus would have turned those stones into bread, it would have been the only time that Jesus used his power for himself instead of for other people. 
powerful, powerful statement. How many times throughout the history of the world have we used our power for ourselves, for our leverage, for our benefit, instead of for other people? Not one time did Jesus use his miraculous power for himself, for his glory. He healed so that people would come to salvation. He healed to deliver people. He healed to set the captives free, to open the eyes of the blind, to make the lame walk, to make the paralytic come up, to forgive sins. He never used his powers on himself. And the devil was saying, You're, if you are the son of God, just do what everyone before you's done. Turn those stones into bread. You have the power. And let's be honest, if we had that power, we would royally mess it up. Oh, my goodness. If I was Jesus, I wouldn't sleep on a floor. Poof, there's my Tempur-Pedic mattress with a pillow <laughs> soft cushion. Or maybe I'd just float in the air and just sleep like that. Someone teased me, said something bad. You know what? Bam, now you're a donkey. How do you like that, right? <laughs> Someone might be using my power left and right. My, my car broke down. Come on, Mercedes convertible. Boom, pow. I'm just... That's not what Jesus does. That's not what he did. He used his power for other people. He emptied himself of his glory. He gave his life so that we can have life. The devil tries. He goes after his identity. He tries to make him use his power for himself. It does not work. He does what he did with Adam and Eve. God is trying to hold something from you. He's trying to, to, to keep things back. That doesn't work. Okay, let's try another tactic. The devil just gives a bold offer of power. To you, I will give all this authority if you bow down and worship me. If you don't believe the devil has some power on this life right now, you're mistaken. People are selling their souls for power every day. And here's what I've seen in the church, outside of the church. It's this, you can write it down. If you are for sale, the devil is willing to pay your price. If you are for sale, he is willing to pay your price. He doesn't care how he gets you. He just wants to get you. And here he comes to Jesus and says, Israel and humanity, they've given me the keys to the kingdom. They failed. They handed. I will give them to you if you just bow down to me. In essence, this is what he's saying. Take a shortcut. Don't die. Don't go through all that sacrifice and death. Bow down to me. We'll make an agreement. We'll, we'll, we'll rule together. You don't have to die. Here's a shortcut. And notice that he showed him. He didn't tell him. He's trying to awake his imagination. What's happening in culture today? They're trying to awake things in our imagination that shouldn't be there. Amen. Bow down to me, Satan says. But Jesus says, it's written, you shall serve the Lord your God only. Only. You see, friends, all of us worship something. We were created to worship. Right now, you are worshiping something. But what are you worshiping? You are going to worship what you see as beautiful. And until God gives you a glory, a glimpse of his beauty, then the things of the world will become shadows in the light of that. We all have to decide what we're going to worship. And we read powerful statements like this, as for me and my house, we will serve, we will worship the Lord. Jesus overcomes that second temptation. He doesn't take a shortcut in friends, Let's be honest, how many times have we taken a shortcut? How many times, instead of waiting, we took matters into our own hands? We forced an issue. We, instead of dealing with the full weight of something, we went around it. Jesus didn't tap. It wasn't nails that held him on the cross. It was his love for you and I. So that doesn't work. Let's try tactic number three. Satan quotes scripture. The devil, quoting Psalms 91. Too bad he doesn't understand the concept of Psalms 91, but he tries. Jesus, we're on Jerusalem. Throw yourself off. Do something amazing and people will worship you. Use your power for your glory, but Jesus emptied himself of his glory. He twists scripture. It's the same thing he did to Adam and Eve in the garden. Did God really say not to eat? Did God really say not to do this? How many times in your life has the devil whispered that in your ear? Did God really say? Did God really? Can, can you trust him? He's holding something back. No, no, no. If, if you do it this way, this is how you'll get it. No, that, I know that, that's just, that's just a, a principle, but you can go around that. How many times has the devil whispered in your ear to lie? 
And what is Jesus' response? It is written, it is written, it is written, it is written. Friends, I want to let you know that there is power in life in the Word of God. Jesus was the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He knew his scripture. He quoted Deuteronomy over and over and over again. If you want to have victory over the enemy, you need to get this on your heart. You need to seal it on your heart. You got to be in this word. So when the enemy comes at you with fear, you can say, no, God has not given me a spirit of fear, but a power and a love of sound mind. When he presents to you anxiety, no, no, do not be anxious for anything but prayer or supplication with thanksgiving. Present your request to God and the peace of God which passes understanding will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. When he says you're a failure, you're a loser, you're a sinner, you say, no, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. As far as the east is to the west and the north and to the south, he has put my sins into the sea of forgetfulness. When people cheat on you and abandon you, you can read there's one who will never leave me, never forsake me, that he sticks closer than a brother. When you're getting tired, you can say, oh, those that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagle. They will run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not grow faint. When you're going through the shadow of death, you can say, I'll fear no death for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. When the enemy comes down towards you, he can be a standard to rise up against that. You, you need this thing in your heart. You need it because that's how Jesus, it is written, it is written, it is written. When is the fight? It's always. Where is the fight? Right down your heart vying for your allegiance to kingdoms. And I find it interesting, one more thought on the enemy's tactics. It's something small, just, just stones into bread. No one's here, it's just me and you. I won't tell anybody. It, it's just bread. You are the bread of life. Come on, Jesus. Just one little trick. But it's one compromise after compromise after compromise, which leads to the catastrophe. There was a producer who made a movie about Hitler in his early life, and people were in an uproar. Don't portray this monster as a human. How can you do that? And people were fired up. And the producer said, uh, said something amazing. He said this, the movie's not about his great crimes. We already know about them, but his small sins, his emotional cowardness, his envy of others, his collected nurture offenses, his desperate need for recognition, Later, Hitler, yes, he was a monster, but nobody wakes up and slaughters a million people. You make a choice one at a time. Of course he was human. You have to make it clear to people that he was a human being, and that is the dangerous thing. Just turn it into bread. Just one compromise, just one lie, just one. But sin leads to sin, leads to sin, leads to death. It's the little foxes that spoil the vineyard. It's one compromise at a time. And all of a sudden, I've become my worst fear. I become what I never thought I would become. One sin, one compromise at a time. If I were to end this teaching right now and said, okay, guys, Jesus is your example. Go on and do it. Be full of the Spirit. Be led by the Spirit and know your word. I would fall short because that's just part. Because what is our hope? Our hope is this. Jesus Christ. Jesus is not just an example. Jesus is our substitute. Jesus is our substitute. And just as the animal was killed to cover the nakedness of Adam and Eve in the garden, Jesus, the Son of God, was killed to cover our nakedness and shame. He's not just an example. He is the Son of God. He is the sacrificial Lamb. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. What is our hope? Jesus Christ, the hope. Our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ and righteousness. When is the battle? Always. Where is the battle? Right between your heart. Two kingdoms vying for your allegiance. What is our hope, friends? Our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ and his righteousness. He lived the life we should have lived. He died the death we deserved. What is the gospel? The gospel is this. You and I are more wicked than we want to admit. Yet at the same time, we are more intimately, deeply, and passionately loved than we can ever imagine. Have you experienced that love today? Have you experienced his love? With everybody with your head bowed and your eyes closed, I want to give you an opportunity. 
Have you started a relationship with Jesus Christ? Have you received the sacrifice and the forgiveness that is available? He loves you. He loves you and he's coming back. Every knee will bow, but the key is you have to do it before he comes back. If you want to start that relationship right now, I want to agree with you. Will you raise your hand all across this room? You're saying, today, I want to start a relationship with Jesus Christ. Is there anyone in this room? I just want to agree with you. Today, I want to start a relationship with Jesus Christ. I see your hand. Anybody else? You're saying, today is the day I want to start a relationship with Jesus Christ. Praise God. You can put your hand down. God, you are good. God, you are so good. There's one more thing I've been wanting to do. Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit. I want to give you an opportunity to experience the Holy Spirit right now. How do I receive the Holy Spirit? Just ask. Just ask. If we and all of our idiosyncrasies know how to give good gifts, how much more Heavenly Father will give the gift of the Holy Spirit to those who ask? As we have this moment of worship, if you would like to come up to the front, I'm going to have the prayer team here and some pastors and some leaders. If you want to kneel down, you want to stand, but this is a powerful moment right now. If you want to be filled once again, if you're feeling empty, if you want to experience that Holy Spirit, the way Jesus did, all you have to do is ask. Let's worship. The front is open. Come and receive anyone who wants to receive it.
Father, there is none like you. There is none like you. Thank you for what you're doing, not just in this church, but in your church around the world. Thank you that you're pouring out your spirit. And I pray for our nation, Lord, let there be a revival. Let people repent. Let people turn to you. I pray for our governments and our presidents. I pray for our nation. Lord, open our eyes to our rebellion like the nation of Israel. Your word says that if we repent, you will hear from heaven, forgive our sins, and heal our land. Heal our land, we pray. Forgive us. Set us on fire with the Holy Spirit. We need you, we need you, we need you. And thank you for having victory where everyone else failed. You are the Messiah. You are the Messiah. You are the King. We love you. And everyone praise us in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We all shouted, amen, and amen, and amen. Oh, God is good. God is so good. Friends, I'm so proud of you. I love you guys. If you need more prayer, we're going to be here afterwards. If not, we'll see you next week. week